Good morning. Good to see everybody today. Today, if you'd be opening to your Gospel of John, we'll be in the 11th chapter, one of the probably longest, if not the very longest, narrative sections in the Gospel of John, which is full of narrative sections. But we have a fuller story here because of its great importance, the central nature of it to all the things that come after. It's after the events of this chapter. It says, from that day on, they planned together to kill him. We already saw in chapter 10, they didn't mind killing him at all. He spoke to them and they picked up stones. They tried to seize him as he spoke to them. He wouldn't go to Jerusalem, which is an important background for a couple of uh, facts here. Uh, Jesus was down in the, the Jordan when he was near Jerusalem, preaching where John the Baptist had first baptized. And then comes word that their dear friend is sick. And so from that, we have today's title for the first part of chapter 11, Our Friend is Dead. And that will combine the words from verse 11 and verse 14, the words of Jesus. Let's read this first section, first parts of John 11. And then we'll discuss. Now a certain man was sick. Lazarus of Bethany. The village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment. And wiped his feet with her hair. Whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold. He whom you love is sick. And when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, but he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples said then to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. So you may believe, but let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let's go also, so that we may die with him. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she had heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, 
even he who comes into the world. So there we have that most important and clear and full confession. A confidence that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus has promised that he will raise the dead not done in some abstract way, not done in some uh, place where you can coolly and calmly think about it all, but right there in the cemetery where they had just days before buried her brother. And so we find this pivotal event starts with the sickness and death of a friend of Jesus. Before we go further, let's pause for prayer. Our Father, help us. Help us each day of our life to recognize that you can do all things and you will one day call all from the grave. If we are there, you will call us. If we are waiting on you, when you come, you will call us. And that you are, as Mary truly confessed, the Christ, the Son of God who's come to the world and is our Savior. Help us in these things to appreciate that and may we, like the disciples, through these things, come to believe. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at John 11, we're going to divide this up into five parts. Today, looking at part one and probably, maybe, part two. First, Lazarus, and then the statement of Jesus we just read that I'm the resurrection of the life. In future lessons, Jesus weeps and Jesus raises Lazarus. I think these may be some of the most familiar things to us in all the Gospel of John. Even the, the Gospel that has that God so loved the world that whoever believes in His only begotten Son should have eternal life. That uh, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was God and the Word was with God. Even with all that, this may be the most familiar full story to us. It's a, a sermon, a chapter I like to make a sermon and, and preach at funerals. Uh, there you get an abri- abbreviated version of it. Uh, because there's only so much you can say that very day, and uh, we don't usually deal with the part about the Jews plotting and all that uh, at the the, uh, funeral service version of this sermon. But this is one of the loveliest uh, chapters, I think, in the Scripture. It's so touching. It does have one of the most touching events in all of Jesus' ministry, his weeping. It's the favorite verse of all children made to memorize Scripture. The shortest verse. Um, the other day somebody asked, uh, it was on a social media post, one of the preachers I followed, he said, what's the longest verse in Scripture? And I, honestly, I had no idea. And when I read it, I go, oh, that's why I don't have any ideas. It's something about Esther, about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, government officials and messages being sent out through the bureaucracy. Uh, you know, sort of the uh, um, uh, you know, least interesting things possible, but just setting the historical detail. But no, we don't remember the, remember the long verse, but the short verse we remember and, and the, the great command, Lazarus, come forth. Well, that's all set up because, well, of Lazarus. And we find him in the first section here. We're going to find him sick, asleep, dead. That's how we're going to find him. Sick, asleep, dead. Uh, Lazarus is the short form, the nickname form of the name Eleazar, which means uh, God is my helper. And of course, Jesus, that is the, uh, in Hebrew, the the Hebrew name uh, Yoshua, which means uh, uh, God uh, is a savior. So here, God the savior is going to help and raise uh, the Lord is my helper. And so it's interesting there just on the names. But Lazarus, and other than (coughs) this and Brief mention that he's present at an event in chapter 12, the same event which verse 2 makes mention of before it happens, but just to set that these are the same people. Uh, Lazarus will be present there when his sister will anoint Jesus with the costly uh, ointment. Uh, It gives us the the impression that these are people of some means, uh, but otherwise there's so little we know about them, except that Jesus loves them. We know that about them. We know Jesus loves them. We uh, can see by their actions that they do love Jesus and that they are faithful disciples of Jesus. And and they are ones who get from Jesus uh, the greatest of blessings. But what we mainly note here is the appeal of the sisters 
to Jesus, and if someone is sick, to whom do we appeal? How many prayers do we offer? Offer in faith. But they offer a prayer of faith to Jesus, a very understated one, not giving any suggestion, actually, about what Jesus would do, but just informing him of the one that you love is sick. And honestly, you know, that, I think, needs to be and should be and we should recognize this is, is really our appeal to God, that God help those whom you love. You love Lazarus, Lord, and he needs your help. And so it's a very understated prayer. It's a very dependent prayer. And it's not a prayer that tries to justify that he's worthy of help because he's done charitable deeds, which I'm sure he has. Uh, he's a faithful disciple that Jesus loves of a family of means. How much good do you think this guy's done? But the, the basis of the prayer is not based on that. The, the prayer is not based on, Lord, you know how much he loves you. But that, Lord, you love him. And as much as we do love Jesus, and we ought and we should, and love him you know, with, uh, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that is our first commandment, right? And as Christians, we apply that statement of God to, to the triune God, to Jesus in particular as the one who came to be with us. We are to love him. But our, our basis of appeal, I think, is on much stronger ground when we say, Jesus, help me because you love me, rather than, Jesus, help me because I love you. Right? Uh, on one side of that love, I know where the fault is. I know where the failure's been. I know where the weakness has been. I know where uh, the slip-ups have been. On the other side, I know where the perfection has been. And I know where... I know where the power lie. And so, Lord, the one you love is sick. So we find him first sick. Some messenger had to have been sent from their house to where Jesus was. And who knows how long it took the messenger to find them or how long it took the messenger to go. We just know that they're somewhere that's not Judea because the guys say, hey, uh, remember last time we were in Judea? So they're at least somewhere outside of Judea. They may be where we last left them in chapter 10, just, uh, you know, down by the Jordan, not too far away. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, they, they, they could have been 20 miles away. They could have been halfway to Galilee. We don't know where they were. And we don't know how long it took to go back. But Jesus says, this sickness is not to end in death. Now, verse 4 tells us this sickness will not end in death. Yet what do we know? We know in it there is death. But I think it's important that it doesn't end in death. And so it is, and we tell ourselves, again, this is why it's such a great passage to use at the cemetery. It's such a great passage to use in funerals, that though there is a death, it's an interregnum, it's, a, it's an imposition, it's a it's a partial time in the middle. It's not the end of the story. The story of the, this believer Lazarus who dies does not end in death. Even though there's a, definitely a death chapter there, right? There's a four or five day death chapter because he's been buried when he, we'll find out as well as we read a minute ago, he's been buried four days when they get there. Generally Jews were buried the same day as of death. They'd be buried, if at all possible, before sundown on the same day of death. So likely it has been four days. It might have been five. But it's been four or five days since he died. In the story of Lazarus, there is four or five days of death. But it's not the end of the story, right? This will not end in death. It is not to end in death. And so we think about our story, right? Because we always want to put ourselves in the Bible story and that's a good way to learn and make application of what parts of this are applicable to us in our lives, right? There's always the people who get these things wrong uh, as to which part applies to them in their life. There's people who say, oh, my child died, I'm going to pray and God will raise them, right? Uh, every, every year or two, uh, somewhere, uh, for some reason it seems to be in the Caribbean nations more than any others, but for some reason there's always some minister down there uh, uh, who said he's going to raise somebody from the dead, his dad or his brother or a minister is dying, and he says, I'll come back, and, well, wh what happens? Eventually the family just has to give up and bury him, right? 
And everybody goes, oh, end of story. Well, there's, a, there's an inevitability of death and an interregnum of death in everybody's story, unless we're alive when he comes back. But the story doesn't have to, and if we're a believer, does not end in death. There's another chapter after that. So what, what do you say when there's another chapter after that? Well, that wasn't the end, was it? There's another chapter after that. And so this will not end in death. He says, no, but for the glory of God. This will end in the glory of God. So that the Son of God may be glorified by it. So this will glorify Jesus, and it will glorify God. It will glorify God through Jesus. And isn't that the whole point of the gospel? It will glorify God through Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we are to seek to do? And so glorifying God through Jesus, as he had said in the prior chapter, chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. And as he said back in chapter 5, verse 23, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Well, this is why the true believers all kind of interfaith dialogue where they get the Hindu, the Jew, the Muslim, and the Christian up there, and they're all going to worship God together or praise God together or approach God together. That's, all, that's always repugnant because how does the Christian honor the Father apart from the Son? And if he's up there on the stage with everybody else who denies the Son, well, he's either got to go along and not honor the Son that day, or he's got to, you know, be the fly in the ointment. And guess which one most of the guys chosen to be on the stage do? It's not to be the fly in the ointment. If we know that guy's like that, we're not going to invite him, right? He won't be on the stage. No, it's to honor the Father through the Son. All right, now as it goes on, Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Jesus loved them all. And I, I can see already this is going to be the only slide we get to. There is no going to part two. But notice when it said he loved them. The fact that, as the next verse says, he heard he was sick. The fact that we, our families, our dear brethren, get sick. Deathly sick, untimely sick, tragically sick, chronically sick. Sick even unto death. And not sick to death like your mother was, but like honestly sick, really to death. Because my mother was always sick to death, but she's still with us. So I guess the sickness wasn't quite unto death. Maybe that's just because she was dealing with me. But, uh, and that other sister of mine, or two. But just because the disciples get sick, have other reversals of life, have other things of which are worthy of prayer and seeking relief, that does not and has not separated them from the love of Christ. Right? You think about Romans 8. What would separate us from the love of Christ? Oh, a chronic skin disease. No. Kidney failure. No. Something that kills you. No. None of that separates you from the love of Christ. Christ's love is there. Regardless of that, these are not the things which Christ has come to save us from. Right Now, Christ came to save us from sin. He calls us out of sin because we're going to be saved from sin, not in it. But when it comes to physical things and physical processes and the like, we're going to be saved in those things and through those things and eventually raised to a body that isn't subject to those things. But in this body, all of those things come and the presence of any or all of those things say nothing about our condition before God and the love of God with us. And letting us suffer in those things might, like in this case, work to the greater glory of God, might teach us needed patience, might just be part of the natural life. Because, you know, if every prayer for healing were always answered, who would die? But obviously it's not God's will we live forever in these bodies of corruption. It's just not. And so in this case, there's going to be a greater miracle soon because Lazarus went through the process of death. I say eventually that will also be true for the all of us. And so then Jesus said, after a short time, verse 7, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. So I don't know where they are, but they're outside Judea. 
the disciples said, hey, uh, Rabbi, uh, just so you know, uh, the Jews were seeking now to kill you. So just the last time we were there, it's their current frame of mind. They do want to kill you. Are you sure we're going there again? Right? Because, as we often do, we like to inform God of situations. We like to inform God of circumstances so that his instruction might need to be you know, mitigated, modified, uh, put off, changed. Of course, God knows. And of course, Jesus knows. Jesus knows the hearts of all men. He knows what those in Judea are. He knows they want to kill him. And she says, no, you know what? There's certain things that are going to happen. There's a certain number of hours in the day, and you can't speed it up, but you also can't slow it down. Verse 9, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? Well, there were axiomatically. They divided the day into 12 hours and the night into 12 more. If anyone walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he, he sees the light of this world. So walk in the light. Walk in the daylight. That goes to what we were talking about in Bible class this morning about being the, the light of the world. In Christ is the light. But if anyone walks at night, he stumbles because the light isn't in him. This is axiomatically true about the sun and travel, but it's also, of course, a callback to Jesus' earlier teaching, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And John 9, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. So, hey, you know, Jesus has been talking all through the Gospel of John about my time has not yet come, my time has not yet come. Well, we're getting to the time being come, right? And so, let's go down there. Now, they're not going to kill Jesus and the disciples on this trip. The disciples are afraid of that. Jesus is not. But we do, and as we saw already from verse 53, this is where they set it to plan to kill him. Before they would have... You know, easily killed him, had the opportunity arisen, and they tried to make it arise. But it wasn't you know, what they were just absolutely set out to do. But now it is going to be, after this, what they have set out to do. So that hour is coming and can't be changed. You, you cannot uh, make more hours in a day. The, the, the time is coming. But also, you can't speed it up and make them less hours a day. So th- what will happen will happen. It will happen according to darkness and light, just as Jesus said. So he tells them, our friend Lazarus, verse 11, has fallen asleep. But I go to wake him up. The disciples not understanding the figure by which Jesus spoke, they go, oh good, he's just sleeping. Someone's sleeping good, they're going to wake up. Sleep is good, sleep is good medicine. It is, isn't it? And sometimes it's the best medicine. And so, hey, he'll recover. But no, this is the common figure of death. In the Old Testament, it's, it's well hinted at. Um, Joseph talked about laying down with his fathers. Uh, I think uh, uh, David talked about lying with his fathers. In the New Testament, though, it's made all the more explicit of actual sleep, not just implied, uh, but the the figures made stronger. Like Stephen in Acts uh, 7, he said, Lord Jesus received my spirit as they were stoning him. He fell to his knees and then cried out with a loud voice, Lord, don't hold this against them. And having said that, he fell asleep. So he wasn't, you know, cradled in the arms of a loving mother and being rocked to sleep. But he was being rocked to sleep, right? Very much so. But uh, he fell asleep under the hail of rocks. But he was asleep. Uh, In Acts 13, uh, Paul describes David as falling asleep after he served God in his own generation. So the Old Testament said he laid down. The New Testament says... By Paul, he fell asleep. In 1 Corinthians 15, there's about five mentions of sleep as death. In verse 6, it talks about the witnesses who saw Jesus, 500 of them, most of whom remain, but some have fallen asleep. And he talked about those who fall asleep in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 use the same figure. So the figure of sleep for death, this is one of those where we might go to the apostle and go, why didn't they see what Jesus was saying? Well, this is something from what Jesus said here becomes for Christians the common expression of death. And before, in the Old Testament, this was hinted at, but not quite so explicitly said. Uh, But having it made clear, having the figure brought out for us, then we can easily see it uh, 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 as as it was. Uh, But they misunderstood. And I have to say, 
How many problems are there in biblical interpretation where people don't understand a figure? You literalize a figure, or you figureize something. Figureize? <laughs> allegorize, you make into a figure, make into a metaphor, that which was clearly stated. And, and it is hard for us, especially through translation sometimes, uh, to get these things correct. But just think about, like in the Lord's Supper, uh, think of the Catholic view of transubstantiation, right? That it, that Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. They take that fully literally, but obviously that's a metaphor, or is it a simile? I forget. One of them, say, one of them you say like, and one of them you don't. But it's either a metaphor or a simile. Allison can uh, tell me and she can tell everybody after I'm done. But it's so obviously a figure, except for the people who don't take it as a figure. No, it's so obvious. This is my body. Right? What, what could be more plain? Well, to me, it's plain. He's talking in a figure. But then we have um, among, our, among our own brethren, those who make the cup into a symbolic element of the Lord's Supper. And so they'll only have one of them. And it's, it's figures of speech that are literalized. Um, the not but constructions all over the scripture. Not this but that. People take the first part as prohibitive instead of an emphasis. Not The first part's not emphasized. The second part's emphasized. Uh, so uh, some of the, the teachings on modesty. Because it'll tell the women, don't let your apparel be this, this, and this, but of that. Uh, Jesus says, and this is one that we don't get wrong because it's, it's it would be too ridiculous to get wrong. But Jesus said, don't work for the bread that perishes, but for the bread of eternal life. So emphasize the spiritual over your, your money, right? Uh, we don't usually, most people don't get that one wrong. But uh, like 1 Corinthians, um, the first chapter, Paul says, I was sent not to baptize, but to preach. And people will see, he didn't baptize anybody. No, we read all over the scriptures of Paul baptizing. But the emphasis is on the preaching. And so get, getting the emphasis of things wrong because we miss the uh, figure. Just getting the figure wrong. That happens all over the scripture. It's a constant thing that bedevils us and we really have to take care. So the apostles missed it. It's a very apt figure. Again, one made clear by Christ. But before it was so, they, they missed it. And so maybe we shouldn't be quite as hard on them as and sometimes explanations of this text are. But verse 13, it said, Now Jesus has spoken of his death. They thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus just told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Again, he's dead, but this will not end in death. From the earthly perspective, though, if that happens to us, that's the end of the earthly perspective of things, right? But in this case, no, it's not because of the power of Jesus. So <coughs> Jesus says, and again, strikingly odd statement, unless he is really sure he knows what he's fixing to go do. I am glad for your sakes I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go. I was glad I wasn't there for your sake. And so we might think about Mary and Martha. They're suffering extra because... Jesus hasn't been there. And we might think, well, why didn't Jesus hurry and go comfort them? But his delay was good for the disciples. And that's the thing when it comes, you know, Jesus, he can help Mary and Martha immediately, or he can help the disciples long term. Which one do you do? Right? We have this multiple goods that can be done. And which good do we choose? And I think sometimes God and the governance of the world uh, he must have these same things. I can do this good or I can do that good. How many goods could God do? But in doing good for one, something better for somebody else is left off. I can't judge or balance these things. God in his infinite wisdom, I believe, can and does. But so often as I judge them from my limited perspective, and my limited perspective is very often based on me, right? My limited perspective is often very small and very self-centered, I want things done by God in another way. And very often on another time scale. Like immediately and for me, right? If, if I'm to judge how God should work, I would think that'd be a good standard. That God does immediately and for me. What if he doesn't? Well, if doing immediately and for me uh, uh, would, would shut out blessings for somebody else who more needed them, 
Well, then what do we do? Well, God knows what to do and he does it. And we have trust that all works to the good for those whom he loves and who love him. So, in this case, the good of him not going was so that you may believe. What did John write this entire book about? John 20, verse 31, these things are written that you might believe. So the whole book is so that the reader might believe. But this one particular action, Jesus (coughs) is working to the same goal (coughs) and here for his apostles so that his apostles might yet more fully believe. And so sometimes I think that uh, when I'm preaching here about belief, I think that some of y'all from sometimes go, well, I already believe, Jay, why you keep telling me to believe? Right? And I get lessons like that too that I hear from other people, and they're telling me to believe, and they're telling me uh, to uh, be strong in faith, they're telling me this or that, and I think, well, why are they telling me that? I already do that. Well, would you put the apostles at this point in the ministry of Jesus, some five or six months before his death, would you put them in the category of believers or not? Why, sure. We'd all put them in as believers, right? But what here six months before his death is Jesus doing with his apostles? Working so they might believe. How much belief do we need to have before we need to have uh, people stop giving us things to believe? Reasons to believe. More in Jesus to see and understand and believe. We, don't, we never get to that point. We always need to believe. Even if we say, I'm a believer, we need to believe. Just like that, the man that uh, Jesus healed his boy. He offered that amazing and apparently to human mind contradictory prayer. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right? And so here the apostles don't even know they have unbelief. But they still need help in believing. And so do I. And so, as we conclude verse 16, Thomas says, who's called Didymus. We don't know anything about his twin. He must be a good guy because he's a twin. Always partial to twins. Most of them except for one. Sorry. Thomas the twin says, hey, let's go that we may die with him. This is kind of a sober, maybe even sad, but resolute faith. How do we know Thomas? We know him from his doubts later on when he expressed that he did not see the risen Savior, so he would not believe in the risen Savior. We know him forevermore as doubting Thomas. Why don't we know him as potential martyr Thomas? He says, well, guys, he's going. Let's go. Because he's the master. We're the disciples. Where the master goes, the disciples follow. Yeah, but we're going to get killed doing it. Well, I know, but we're with him. We follow him. I will follow him wherever he may go. I think that's a pop song, not a hymn. But he's going to go. Now, the thing is, You know, when it got to the actual point of that actually happening six months later and in Jerusalem and Judea, they arrest Jesus and the disciples flee. In in, in the night when he was actually asked to do that, he didn't quite uh, live up to this. But months before, he had the mind too. And so we do note that, yeah, he needed strengthening. He thought he was ready to die for Jesus. Turns out even after this, he wasn't quite. But of all the apostles, what do we eventually know? Well, they all are ready to die for Jesus, aren't they? And they all do. They all do. The only apostle uh, whom we have any indication at all he did not die a death of the martyr is John. And he certainly seemed willing and capable, but he wasn't called to. So Lazarus is dead, and they're going to go, but that's not how this story ends, because that's only verse 16. Well, we got 40 more verses of John 11 to go. So it's not the end of the story when he dies. And it's not the end of our story when we die either. So on what do we base this hope? Well, that we believe in Jesus to eternal life. But also, and probably even more so, that he loves us. Right? He loves us. With that confidence then, we conclude today. Ask if you need to come confess your faith. Come into the express love of Jesus, which he has offered for his people, those who uh, have been added to him and to his body and be adopted by God, be made the family of God. 
If anyone needs to come confess that and be baptized today, or if anyone needs to confess sin to return, we offer the invitation now as we stand and sing.